Well, good morning and welcome to another online service of Good Life Church. We are so thankful that you're joining us and another opportunity for us to set our eyes on Jesus, to share in the good news together, and also, even though we're kind of separated physically, to meet here in this digital space and share life together as well. I want to give you a couple ways that we can do our best in sharing life during this season. The first is right now, as you're watching this, I would direct you to the online chat feature we have. Again, I know we're not physically in the same place, but this online chat helps us feel a little bit like maybe we are, and it's a good way for us to share life together as we engage with the service this morning. Two more things I wanna fill you in on on staying connected. The first is email, info at goodlifefl. Com. If you want to know more information about who we are as a church family or maybe how you can take some next steps in your faith walk and following Jesus, please email us at info at goodlifefl.com. Another way if you prefer to do that is to simply visit our website goodlifefl.com slash online church. Now speaking of, this is our online service for this morning and we're really looking forward to it. We have a really special time of worship and we're closing out our series called Unexpected where we've been studying the scriptures and looking at the life of Joseph and seeing how we navigate through life's detours. But before we get there today, we have a special guest that's joining us for worship. And this special guest, his name is Ryan Whitfield. Now Ryan is the worship pastor at the King's Church in Lakeland, Florida. And I'm really excited about this because the King's Church is a church plant in Lakeland. And I think it's a beautiful picture of the kingdom for the church plant in Lakeland, the King's Church, to be joining us, a church plant in Bradenton this morning. And at the heart of Good Life Church has always been multiplicity. That we know that without the investment of other churches, without the investment of leaders who've given their time, their energy, their money, their passions, that we may not be able to be meeting here today. And in the same way, I think it's beautiful for these two church plants to come together and give a picture of the kingdom. So you're gonna see Ryan leading with us here in just a moment in the King's Church in Lakeland in Good Life Church here in Bradenton. We're gonna combine a little bit for our worship portion this morning. But before we get there, I would love to open us up in prayer. And as we pray, I just encourage you, let's just invite the Lord and His peace and His joy into our life right now. And I know that maybe you're watching this on your couch or in your bed or whatever in your PJs. No judgment there. But let's just focus our minds and our hearts and realize that even though we may not be in the same room at the same time, God is not bound to some physical building. That studying the scriptures, that worshiping Jesus, he can meet us right now, wherever we may be. So together, let's pray and then we'll worship and set our eyes on Jesus as a church family. So Jesus, we come to you this morning and we just confess that sometimes this is difficult for us because we are a little bit more isolated where we are. And Jesus, we just ask that supernaturally this morning that you would do a work that even though we, we may be separated physically, that you would knit our hearts and our lives together. God, that supernaturally you would work in our life, that you would give us your joy and your peace. And as we study your scripture today, as we worship you, we pray that everything we do would be about you, Jesus, about you being glorified and you being honored. And we ask that in your name, the, the name above every other name, amen. Come on, let's sing this out in victory. The dark tried to hide you and steal you away. Death tried to keep you inside of the grave. The enemy fought you, he tried, but he lost. Oh, you cannot be stopped. Come on, there's freedom. We know. When we cry for freedom, Tore down the walls. The weight of our burdens, you carry them all. All our fears, our failures, and our fears and our failures hang dead on the cross. Oh, you 
cannot be stopped. Come on, we declare it. This is our God. We sing. The mover of mountains, breaker of chains, Jesus has triumphed over the grave. We sing hallelujah. The battle is won. Oh, nothing can stand against our God. We stand on your victory, we shout out your praise. Miracle maker, you're mighty to say. Awesome in power, relentless in life. stop our God. Oh, there's nothing that can stop our God. There's nothing that can stop our God. There's nothing. Can we sing that again? There's nothing. You cannot be stopped. Oh, there's nothing that can stop our God. You cannot be stopped. There's nothing that can stop our God. Stop our God, there is none. Can we sing that again? We let our faith rise. There's nothing. There's nothing that can stop our God. There's nothing that can stop our God. There's nothing that can stop our God. There is nothing. out the giver of life. We sing this loud together, church. You give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord. It's your breath in our lives. So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lives. So we pour out our Praise to you only. Can we confess again? We sing. You get. You give light. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart. That is broken. That's right. Your breath, it's your breath, and 
shout your praise Our hearts will cry These bones will sing Great are you, Lord All the earth will shout your praise Our hearts will cry These bones will sing us you care for us so much God that before the foundation of the world you set in motion a plan to redeem us as your people so God we praise you we praise your name above all names this morning Father God that you alone will be worshiped no matter where we are whether we're driving in the car right now maybe we're at home with our family whatever the case may be God this incredible promise that you present to us Lord presents a peace in our lives God and that is why you are worthy of our worship. That is why we praise you. That is why we sing you, God. So we ask of you to be glorified in our lives during this time. We love you and we praise you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Hey, what's up, Good Life? Just want to take a second during this morning service to update you guys on the COVID-19 restrictions. Our state's continuing to ease some of the restrictions on gatherings, and so we're prayerfully considering what the next step is for Good Life. A Terra Elementary is not an option for us currently because Manatee County Schools continues to restrict any outside usage of school facilities by outside groups like us. So Terra is not an option for us right now. Thankfully, we have the venue, but according to current guidelines, we'd be restricted to peep to no more than 25 people in the room at any one time. So that's a little limiting right now, but we're prayerfully considering it. But what we'd like to have right now as we wait to see what sort of the next phase looks like, we'd like to have some of your feedback. We'd like to hear from you as to where you are in terms of what you're thinking, in terms of what you're feeling, in terms of what you'd like to see happen for you and for your family. So we're making available at the conclusion of this morning's service an online survey. It'll be available on our website, goodlifefl.com, and we'll be emailing it out to everybody that's on our mailing list. Now, we know how surveys usually go. We hear from 10 or 15 faithful people, but we're inviting all of you to please speak into this process for us. Help us hear where you are and what you're thinking so that we can make an informed and prayerful decision. It'll only take you about five minutes to complete, but it'll go a long way in helping us know what to do for the next phase of reopening for Good Life Church. We appreciate your faithfulness during this time to continue to gather online, to continue to connect remotely, to continue to give faithfully. And we appreciate all you guys are doing to make good life possible and to have us continue to live out our mission to love enough to share the good news as we look forward to being able to share life in person in the near future. So thank you for your help with this and thank you for your continued prayers. Current success does not guarantee an enduring legacy. Just because you're celebrated today does not mean you'll be celebrated tomorrow. 
For instance, let me point to something ridiculous to make that point. There was a time that the Macarena was the number one song in the country. For 14 weeks, starting in 1996, the Macarena was the number one song in the nation. It was everywhere, proms, weddings, whole sports stadiums, everyone was doing the Macarena. And now, 25 years later, we all just hope and pray there's not grainy cell phone footage somewhere that somebody has kept of us doing the Macarena. But there was a time it was the number one song in the nation. But if you polled people today, I think it'd be voted the number one most obnoxious song ever written. Now, it's not just true for one hit wonders. I think it's true in other areas of life as well. The fashion of today becomes the punchline of tomorrow. The must have toy at Christmas is in the trash by Easter. And the same is probably true of our lives as well current success is not a guarantee of an enduring legacy. Just because we're riding high now does not mean that will last. And just because we're being successful in the way we define success today does not mean we'll view it that way 10 years from now, 20 years from now. And it doesn't mean that what we define as success today will produce the legacy that impacts generations to come. Over the last few weeks, we've been walking through the life of a man called Joseph, walking through the unexpected twists and turns of his painful life. And we've seen how through the twists and turns, things he never would have signed up for, how God was at work in his life. At 17, he's betrayed by his brothers and sold into slavery, and he lands in the house of Potiphar in Egypt. He's accused of a crime he didn't commit in that house, and he's thrown into prison. He's forgotten by the cupbearer for two whole years after he helped him by interpreting a dream. Through all those things, we as the reader and certainly Joseph as the main character must have wondered what sort of story he was living, what sort of story God was telling through this painful, awful, unexpected life. But then we reached a point a couple weeks ago where Joseph is lifted up out of prison. He goes from being a prisoner in the morning to being the prime minister that afternoon. And Pharaoh takes him and makes him second in command over the entire country, puts him over the task of preparing the nation to be ready for seven years of famine that are going to come after seven years of abundance. And Joseph rises to a position of power that he never could have seen coming. And then it seems like the story would end there, and yet the story kept going. We saw last week that Joseph's brothers in the midst of the famine, the ones who had sold him into slavery, came to Egypt looking for food because it was the only place in the world that had it. And we saw that through this long back and forth interaction between them, Joseph reached a point where he revealed his true identity and he forgave the brothers who had started all of his painful detours. And it was a truly remarkable thing for us to see. And it seems like at that point that the story would be over. And yet the story keeps going. When we wrapped up last week, Joseph told his brothers that he had forgiven. He said, go back to Canaan, get my father Jacob and bring him here. Let my family be restored and reunited and let you find safety from the famine in the country that God led me to. And when that happened, when, when he sent them off, it seems like, man, what a beautiful reunion this is going to be. Let's see if that's actually what happens. Look at Genesis chapter 45, and let's begin at verse 25. It says this, So they went up out of Egypt, and they came to the land of Canaan, to their father Jacob. And they told him, Joseph is still alive, and he is ruler over all the land of Egypt. And Jacob's heart became numb, for he did not believe them. But when they told him all the words of Joseph and what he had said to them, and when he saw the wagons that Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of their father Jacob revived. And Jacob, who's called Israel, said, It is enough. Joseph, my son, is still alive, and I will go, and I will see him before I die. Verse 1 says, So Israel took his journey with all that he had, and he came to Beersheba. And he offered sacrifices to the God of his father Isaac. And God spoke to Jacob in visions of the night. And he said, Jacob, Jacob. And he said, Here I am. And the Lord said, I am God, 
the God of your father. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for there I will make you a great nation. I myself will go down with you to Egypt, and I will also bring you up again. And Joseph's hand shall close your eyes. You see, all Joseph's painful detours are over. All of Joseph's pain, painful detours led to what appears to us to be a purpose, a purpose of saving the world from a famine. And yet the story keeps going. And when Joseph forgives his brothers, the story keeps going. And so then the story here at the end of the book of Genesis pivots back to Jacob and back to Canaan. And we wonder, like, why are we still going through this? There are more chapters dedicated to the reunion and the restoration of Jacob and Joseph and, and this family than there are to the flood or the creation account. What is God trying to communicate to us by spending so much time on the inner workings of this family? Well, there's a lot that's going on here that we have to catch. This is an important part of God's plan. And there's something we are supposed to understand by this incredible focus that this restoration of this family is getting in Scripture. What we're supposed to see is that, and we're supposed to understand at this sort of after credits of Joseph's story, is that God has been faithful to keep his word. As Jacob is heading down to Egypt, blown away by the fact that his son Joseph, his long lost favorite son, he finds out that he's alive. As he's going back to Egypt, God appears to him. And he appears to him to remind him of the promise that he gave to his grandfather Abraham to the promises that, that, that God was continuing to be faithful to. He's saying, Jacob, go on down to Egypt, and I'm going to be faithful to keep my word. And in this, what I want us to see is this good life, that even when their path was unexpected, God's faithfulness was undeniable. Even through every twist and th turn of Joseph's life and of Jacob's family life, the dysfunction that they had there, God's faithfulness was undeniable. God was still true to his word, and he was still being the person he said he was and doing the things that he said he would do. And I tell us that not so we can understand jo Jacob's and Joseph's life, but so that we can understand ours. Through every twist and turn in our lives, I believe Scripture communicates clearly that God has been faithful. Whether we can see it right now or not, God has been faithful and will be faithful. He's been positioning us and preparing us through every twist and turn of our unexpected lives. He's been preparing us and positioning us for the good works he's prepared for us to do, just like he did with Joseph. Joseph and his family, they'd walked down a path they never would have chosen. They've experienced pains that they never would have signed up for, but God had used all of it for his glory, and we see now, even for their good. Look at verse 27. All the persons of the house of Jacob who came into Egypt were 70. And jumping down to verse 29, then Joseph prepared his chariot and he went up to meet Israel, Jacob, his father in Goshen. And he presented himself to him and he fell on his neck and he wept on his neck for a good while. And Israel said to Joseph, now let me die since I have seen your face and know that you are still alive. You see, Jacob has two names, Jacob and Israel. God uses both names and it jumps back and forth. So Jacob and Joseph are reunited. We have to remember that until his brothers came back, Jacob believed that his son was dead, torn apart by a wild animal is what he'd been told. And then he hears his son is alive. And in this moment, they are restored. Remember, the last time they had a conversation with each other was the day that Jacob told Joseph to put on his coat of many colors, go out into the wilderness to find his brothers to make sure they were being obedient. J Joseph never came back. And this is a moment of beautiful reuniting, of God providing a wonderful moment of calm and healing for a family that had experienced much pain. But there's something tucked in what we just read that's probably more important than, the, than this reuniting a hug between father and son. There's something that's even more key. The, all the members of Jacob's family came to the safest place on earth. 70 people, Jacob's sons, 
12 sons, one daughter, all of them, they come and they find a safe place in Egypt. Why is that important? Well, because this is an important family in God's plan. This is a family through which God is going to bless the whole world. God had come to Abraham and said, you are going to have offspring that outnumber the stars and outnumber the grains of sand on the shore, even though he had no children at the time. But that wasn't the best part of the promise. The promise was, and one day the whole world will be blessed through your offspring. What did that mean? Well, God was pointing to the coming of his son, Jesus. And that was going to happen through this family. This dysfunctional mess of a family was going to be the family through which the Messiah would come. And the most important part of the story, the reason the story of Joseph keeps going, is that it's bigger than Joseph. This is about Jesus. And this story keeps going because the most important part for us to see is that those 70 people, the children of Israel, the children of Jacob, are all coming to Egypt to have a safe place in the midst of a global famine that still has five years left. That's the most important thing that's happening in the story. So Jacob is able to live out his final days in relative calm and relative peace and in, in, a, in a season of less dysfunction than his family has ever experienced. And then, after a few years pass, Jacob realizes that death is near. So he calls all of his sons to him, and he blesses them. He blesses each of them individually. He blesses Joseph's two sons individually. And those would become the tribes of Israel. And then Jacob died. Jacob breathed his last, Joseph was there to close his eyes, and Joseph and his brothers carried Jacob back to Canaan, to the land that had been promised to his grandfather Abraham, and his remains were buried there. But the death of Jacob reopened some old wounds. Let's look at Genesis chapter 50, and we'll look at verse 15. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, it may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil that we did to them. But Joseph said to them, Do not fear, for am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear. I will provide for you and your little ones. Thus he comforted them, and he spoke kindly to them. You know, dysfunction can diminish, and it certainly did in this family, but it didn't disappear. You see, when Jacob died, all of those brothers began to think, hold on, our brother's the second most powerful person in the most powerful country in the world. And now that dad is dead, you know, maybe Jacob's going to settle all debts. Maybe he's going to go all godfather, Michael Corleone on them and settle all the family business. But Joseph takes a deep breath and he looks at them with love and compassion. And he says to them, I'm not in the place of God. It is not my place to enact judgment and vengeance on you. And he says to them, an incredible statement that we cannot miss. You meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. If for a second we could grasp this truth, and if we really lived according to this truth, I believe it would help us to unravel all the unexpected twists and turns of our lives. If we could grasp that even the most evil things that have ever been done against us by people who meant it for evil, that God can use that for good. I believe our unexpected detours of life, the purpose of them would start to be revealed. We trip over how God could let that happen and how evil people are. And those are questions that I completely and totally get. But if we could land where Joseph landed, that what you meant for evil, brothers, God meant for good. I believe it would change everything. To believe that God does work all things together for good even the evil that people have done against us. That could change everything. So let's see how Joseph's story ends. Look at chapter 50, verse 22. It says, So Joseph remained in Egypt, he and his father's house. And Joseph lived 110 years. And Joseph saw Ephraim's children to the third generation. And Joseph said to his brothers, I'm about to die, but God will visit you. And he will bring you up out of this land to the land that he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Then Joseph made the sons of Israel swear, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry my bones up from here. So Joseph died, being 110 years old, and they embalmed him, and they put him in a coffin in Egypt. Joseph lived to a ripe old age of 110. At 17, his life took an unexpected detour. 
For 13 years, that detour was nothing but pain and suffering and heartache, having no idea what God was doing. At the age of 30, he's lifted up out of the prison, and he is put in a position of power. And all those times of pain have been positioning him and preparing him to do something amazing. From 30 to 110, Joseph led faithfully. And Joseph served faithfully. And Joseph loved faithfully. And Joseph believed God faithfully. And he reaches a point in the end of his life where he says, I believe that God is going to take us out of Egypt someday and bring us to the land that God promised to our great-grandfather. And that he's going to be faithful, just as he's been faithful in my life, even though it's a life I may not have signed up for. So Joseph dies. He's buried. He tells his brothers and his family, take my bones with you when you come out. And so surely this is the end of Joseph's story. Joseph has died. We've reached the end of the book of Genesis. Uh, we've, we've seen his story unfold. We've seen it go through unexpected twists and turns. Surely this is the end of Joseph's story. But if you turn the page in your Bibles to the very next page, Joseph's names come up. And he comes up in such a way that we would think that surely somebody who had been a part of this incredible life, somebody who had been a part of saving the world, of course they'd be remembered. That success in his moment, that current success, would have certainly produced an enduring legacy. But we turn the pages of our Bibles, just one page, and we discover that may not be the case. Look with me to Exodus chapter 1, and let's look at verse 8. It says, Now therefore arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. Sometime after Joseph died, and after uh, his, his descendants and the descendants of his brothers, after they had grown from 70 people to a mighty nation of people going into the land of Goshen, fertile land, great land for raising animals like they did, they grew from this set group of 70 people to like numbers of people that became a threat to Pharaoh. Now, Pharaohs had come and Pharaohs had gone over the years, but they remembered Joseph. But there came a point in history where there arose a Pharaoh who didn't remember Joseph. And they looked at this growing threat to their power right in their own land, and they began to treat them poorly. And it says in there something startling that Joseph was forgotten. Your current success is no guarantee of an enduring legacy, but how can somebody who did so much as Joseph be forgotten what seems to us to be so quickly? We have to catch this. Even a man who saved the world will be eventually forgotten by the world. Even a man who saved the world, the world will one day forget them. So why then good life? Do we spend so much of our lives chasing the world's definition of success? Why do we so much in our lives spend our energy and our resources and our character and any number of things that we have, why do we spend so much of our energy chasing down success as the world defines it, chasing down worldly rewards? Why do we chase the acclaim of a forgetful world? when we know that even though the Pharaoh forgot Joseph, God hasn't. Now fast forward with me several hundred years, 400 years, 430 years to be exact. Fast forward to a time where the people of Israel are no longer guests in Egypt, they're now slaves in Egypt because they become a threat to the throne. They become a threatening power. This foreign entity, this foreign group that is getting a bit too strong. So they went from being honored guests in the nation to being slaves of the king, and they are treated very poorly. People murdering their sons and causing them to work incredible hardship, and they are experiencing all kind of slavery, and Jacob's descendants are no longer safe there. They cry out to God, and let's fast forward through a very long story. God raises up Moses, and he sends Moses to Egypt to deliver his people, and God sends plagues to convince Pharaoh to let his people go, and ten plagues come. I say nine plagues come, and nine plagues go, and Pharaoh still won't relent. And then the final plague comes, and Pharaoh says, get your people and go. God heard his cry, and he rescued his people. And I want to jump ahead a little bit in the story to Exodus chapter 12 and verse 37 to see what happened as the people of Israel are leaving Egypt. Verse 37 says, And the people of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Succoth, about 6,000. 
100,000 men on foot, besides women and children. The time that the people of Israel lived in Egypt was 430 years. And Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, for Joseph had made the sons of Israel solemnly swear, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones with you from here. A family of 70 came to Egypt 430 years ago. A family of 70 came to Egypt. A nation of millions marched out. 600,000 men, not counting the women and children. A nation of more than a million marched out of Egypt. And it says in there that they actually plundered the Egyptians as they left, taking some of their gold and their silver with them. And who was remembered 430 years later as the people of Israel marched out of Egypt? Joseph was. Forgotten by the world, but remembered by God and his plan. Why did God allow Joseph to walk through all his painful detours? 430 years later, we see Joseph is remembered. But let's pull back in his story to when he's 17. Why did God allow him to walk through all of those things? He allowed him to walk through them to position and prepare him, not just to save the world. To position and prepare him, not just to rule a nation. To position and prepare him to be a part of what God was doing to raise up a nation unto himself, to set aside a chosen people. He was using Joseph to be a key part of the story where he was raising up the people of Israel, the nation through which he would reveal himself to the world and the nation and the family through which he would bring his son. On the day Joseph was thrown into the pit at 17, do you think he ever believed that one day he'd be prime minister of a world power? On the day that he's wrongfully accused of a crime and thrown in prison, do you believe for a second that he saw in his mind that he was going to use him to save his family and the world from a global famine? Do you believe for a second that when the cupbearer forgot about him for two years, that Joseph understood that God was using him to bring his family to Egypt to raise up a nation of more than a million? In the midst of the unexpected twists and turns of his life, Joseph couldn't see any of these things. And yet he chose to believe that God knew what he was doing. At every twist and turn, at every unexpected detour, Joseph couldn't see what God was doing. Joseph couldn't see the purpose of his pain. But he believed in the God who had allowed it to happen. That nothing would come into his life that hadn't come through the filter of God's hand first. And that God would be faithful to bring about a purpose to even his most painful detour. Joseph's faithfulness in those painful detours echoed through his life and in generations to come, 430 years after his family came to Egypt. Joseph's bones are carried out by a people who never met Joseph, but had been impacted by the story that God was telling through them. When they were experiencing decades of slavery and oppression, I have to think that the promise of Joseph, that the promise that, that, that Joseph had required of his brothers, bring me out when you leave Egypt, gave hope to people who never met him. But through his painful story, generations were impacted. And it wasn't just true in the Exodus. Fast forward more than a thousand years later to the New Testament, to a people who have been set apart by God, much like the Israelites, set apart by being in Christ to pursue making the world know about Jesus and the Savior. But they are experiencing incredible hardship as a result of the task that's been placed before them. And as they do that, they are struggling. And then the writer of Hebrews points back to several people, uh, several people in Hebrews chapter 11 who had walked through painful things but trusted God in the midst of their unexpected detours. And he points back over a thousand years later back to the life of Joseph. Look at chapter 11 of Hebrews, verse 21. It says, By faith Joseph, at the end of his life, made mention of the exodus of the Israelites and gave directions concerning his bones. Joseph had a long, unexpected, painful story. But that story was remembered by the New Testament church more than a thousand years after Joseph had died. He's listed among the great heroes of the faith in Hebrews chapter 11. People like Noah 
and like Abraham and like Isaac and like his father Jacob and David and Samuel and people who trusted God when nothing around them made any sense. They took God at his word and they were faithful through painful seasons of life. But how were those people able to do that? How was Joseph able to endure a story that was nothing but pain for so very long and none of it seemed to make sense? And here's why. Because Joseph's story is remembered because he knew it was never his story. Joseph's story is remembered because he knew that the story God was telling was bigger than the pain he was experiencing. He knew his story was not the end result or the big goal. Joseph trusted the storyteller. Through every painful twist and turn, Joseph believed God and he took him at his word. Now, how could Joseph and every other person in that great hall of faith, how could they walk through unexpected and painful detours? Because they measured success by God's standard not by the world standard. It's hard to say you're successful when you're a slave in Egypt and you're thrown in prison for a crime you didn't commit. It's hard to say I'm being successful right now. But Joseph defined success beyond the chapter of the story that he was living right then. He defined success by how God was seeing him. And that made all the difference. Current success does not guarantee an enduring legacy, but we will leave a legacy one way or the other. What we call Success, the way we define success, will determine what kind of legacy we will leave behind. If we're determining success in our lives by what the world says and chasing it down in areas of life that aren't reflecting God's character and purposes and His calling on our lives as well. If we're chasing down success as the world defines it, that's the legacy we'll leave behind. And if we're chasing down success in that way, what we'll also find is this, is that every painful detour will cause us to rebel against who God is and what he's doing. We will rebel against those unexpected detours because it gets in the way of what the world calls success. But here's what we have to catch. Godly legacies are forged in the fires of unexpected detours. Godly legacies that leave impact on generations, those are forged in the seasons we would never sign up for. Pain will never leave us neutral. It will always force us to make a choice. We will either choose to be obedient or we will choose to be rebellious. The people who come behind us will be impacted by those choices. How we handle the fires of unexpected detours will have ripples in the generations to come. Will the people who come behind us ride the wave of our obedience, or will they be washed by the wake of our sin? We can be obedient in those painful detours in life because we know that God has a purpose for our pain. God can use the story that he's telling through our lives to impact people we may never meet. Generations that come after us may be shaped, may be influenced, they may be called to salvation by the painful stories we never would have wanted to walk through. I'll share one with you. The most significant and uh, sustained influence on my life spiritually has always been my mom. She's a godly woman who loves Jesus, and she's made a, a trem- she has made and continues to make a tremendous impact in my life for Christ. But here's what I know. My mom knows Jesus because of her mom, Carmi. I never met Grandma Carmi. She passed away in January when I was born in August of 1973. Mom was pregnant with me when her mom passed away, but they never knew it at that point. My grandma, Carmi, never knew I was coming. She never got to hold me. She never got to sing to me. She never told me one Bible story. But here's what I know. Grandma Carmi was sick with cancer. And the way she navigated that season, the the trust and the love of Jesus that was present in her life in the midst of that storm impacted the faith of my mom. And so my grandmother, who I never met, shaped my life through my mother, and she never was in the same place with me, in the same time with me, and yet she left a godly legacy that shaped my life tremendously and continues to do so to this day. One of my greatest prayers is that one day I'll be sitting in the room with my children and my grandchildren, and I'll be blown away that they are such better parents than I ever was. Not that I feel like I've been a bad dad or that Julie and I are doing a poor job. I don't believe that we are. But I believe that when the people of God trust God from generation to generation, that we can see the increased faithfulness and obedience of his people. And that's the legacy that I want to leave behind for my kids and for my grandkids as well. 
Each of us are standing on the shoulders of people who came, came before us, whether it's a blood relative who led you to Jesus or somebody who's just a relative in the family of God. We have all come to know Jesus because somebody shared him with us. But somebody influenced them and somebody influenced those people and somebody influenced those people. We are the product of a godly legacy of people who are willing to love enough to share the good news. And we have been called to do the same. And we cannot let the unexpected detours of life derail us from our purpose. Our purpose to know God and to make Him known. We'd love to be remembered 400 years after we've died. But our goal in life isn't to be remembered. Our goal in life is not to have monuments and statues raised to us. No, our ultimate goal is not to be honored, but to live lives that honor God. So good life. Are we living in such a way that we are leaving a godly legacy? Are we living in such a way that we're defining success as God defines it? And that when the painful detours come in our lives, it doesn't make us throw up our hands. It makes us remember that God defines success differently. So as we close our series, I want to ask you a series of questions. A series of questions that I hope will help us come to grips with where we are in our walk with Christ and where we are in navigating life's unexpected detours. First question is this, is the purpose of your life to know Jesus and to make Jesus known? If you aren't saved today, if you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, the pain in your life, its purpose has been to bring you to a point where you realize you're a sinner in need of a Savior and that Jesus paid the price for all the ways you've rebelled and recoiled against the will and the reign of God. And so maybe today the Lord's pulling on your heart and calling you to salvation. If that's the case, please reach out to us. We'd love to walk through that process with you. But maybe you've been saved for a while, but your consuming purpose, your definition of success has not been to know Jesus and to make Jesus known. It's been a compartment of your life that has only defined a small area. Let today be the day that you say, Jesus, I am here to know you and make you known and nothing else is more, more important. No other area of success will satisfy except for that. And if you believe that, that your purpose is to know Jesus and make him known, then, then ask yourself this. Do you believe God can work all things for his glory and for your good? When you step into any painful season, when you feel the pain of life, like what we're facing right now, when you feel that, can you believe that God can work everything for his glory and for your good, for those who are called according to his purpose. Then, do you believe that God can use your painful past to give somebody else a brighter future? If we walk into a painful season, we go, I don't understand why this is happening, but remember, God might use my story to call somebody else to salvation. If that's the case, sign me up for the pain. Because we are here to know Jesus and to make him known. If it's made known through my pain, then Lord, bring the pain. And lastly, I'll ask you this. What are you pursuing today that will not, per, not produce an enduring and godly legacy? Are you defining success in any measure of life with something that will not last? I'm not telling you to change careers or change or sell all your possessions or anything like that. I just want all of us to wrestle with this question. Are we doing anything in our lives that's not centered around the rule and reign of Jesus Christ and our purpose to know him and to make him known. If that's the case, current success does not guarantee an enduring legacy. And success as the world sees it will always fade away. But those who are faithful to the call of God will be remembered by him forever. Let's pray. God, I thank you for your love for us, for your work in our lives for calling us to salvation. And I pray, Lord, if you're calling anyone right now, that they would not rest till they reach out to us, that we get them connected and we get them discipled and we get them walking with you. Lord, I pray you'd help us be a people who want to have, be successful, but only as you define success, who want to leave a legacy, but only a legacy that points people to Jesus Christ. Lord, help us to be a people who truly do love enough to share the good news as we share our lives as well and let our lives be poured out in the pursuit of knowing you and in making you know. We ask that in Jesus' name. Amen.
church family, thank you so much again for being a part of today's online service. I want to say one more time that we love being able to stay connected together, even if it's digitally, it's still important for the local church for us to remain connected and sharing life. I want to give you a couple more ways we can do that as we're closing out our service today. I mentioned it earlier, but I want to mention it one more time. The first is emailing info at goodlifefl.com. That's a great way if you have any questions or you want to take next steps. Also, you can visit our website, goodlifefl.com slash online church. In addition, we're on Facebook and we're on Instagram. We would love to connect with you there. And until next week, I would encourage you that we're going to be kicking off a brand new series next week. And we're going to be looking at a psalm. And it's maybe the most famous psalm in the scriptures, and it's Psalm 23. So I would encourage you between now and next week, it's really short, it might be like 10 verses long, maybe 12. Why don't you and your family take a moment and read Psalm 23, and then next Sunday we will see you right back here at 9.30 to gather together to study Psalm 23 and ultimately to worship the person of Jesus. Church family, we love you guys and cannot wait to see you right back here next Sunday, 9.30. Until then, go in the peace, love, and joy of Jesus, and we'll see you again soon.